Well, good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday evening and it's Pine Dry Baptist Church, and we're having our Zoom meeting tonight, our prayer meeting, more accurately. And I wanted to um, invite all of you and thank all of you who are on uh, our internet tonight. Um, we're going to be taking a look at Matthew chapter 16, if you have your Bibles there, and, and I hope that you do. I, I'm just sitting here, just looking out the, um, the window here in my office. And um, we just had a storm pass through and, and, and quite a bit of rain. I'm sitting here looking at, at large green trees and a pond at, at the base of these trees and then the sun shining through and, and just the water dripping down off the trees. And, and I don't know how you can have a much better uh, reminder of, of God and, and, and of his creation and, and of his universe. So I want to talk to you tonight about recovering from mistakes. I don't know if you have ever made any mistakes in your life. I remember making one uh, several years ago, but uh, I want to talk to you about making, not only making mistakes, but recovering from mistakes, because in sincerity, we all do. And, and it's not just a one-time thing. It's something that as long as we're on this earth, we're, we're in all probability going to be doing that. But we need to know how to recover from these mistakes to stay right there in that relationship with, with God and with Jesus Christ. So would you join me in prayer as uh, we open his word. Heavenly Father God, <clears throat> Lord, we praise you for who you are. Praise you for this day. Praise you for the beautiful picture you have, have uh, shown me here, Lord, as, uh, as this storm passed by and now the sun has, has come up and shining through your trees, nature, the, the beautiful blue sky with, with white clouds in a God. And, uh, and Lord, that, that we can gather here tonight in our homes as Pine Drive Baptist Church. And we can call you Father and we can call Jesus Lord. And we know that the Holy Spirit is living within each one of us, Lord. And Father, you, you know, as you look at our hearts, that we truly want to be everything that you have created us to be. And we know that it's a process. And tonight is just a, another process, another step in the process of becoming more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And yet, Lord, uh, we know that as, as we traverse this path that you've laid out for us, sometimes we really get going and get ahead two steps forward and we get knocked back a step forward so father we thank you that you have written in your word tonight through matthew of a situation of, of a man who made the greatest mistake of his life and yet you showed us how you how he recovered father and I pray, Lord, that, that we would just learn from the lessons that you have for us tonight. Lord, open our hearts, open our ears. For it's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bibles again, chapter 16 uh, of Matthew, <clears throat> we're going to look at about five or six verses there, talking about a message that, um, that I titled, Recovering from Our Mistakes. Um, <clears throat> There's been a lot of times in my life that I thought about other people and, and hope that they didn't make mistakes because of, of the situation that I was in. In other words, hoping that I <clears throat> could truly rely upon them. And, and uh, sometimes when I was flying and, uh, and I got into a challenging situation, I, I was often reminded uh, that uh, the, the lowest bidder got the contract for this aircraft that I was flying. Didn't give me a lot of satisfaction, but I, but I had faith in my ability and faith in, in, in my training in the aircraft. Another time was when, when I, um, in fact, it was 57 years ago, just about this time that I was standing in the door of a C-130 getting ready to make my first parachute jump. And um, kind of thinking, I hope they packed this chute correctly. Well, the Army has a group of special workers <clears throat> and they're called riggers. And their job is to fold and pack the parachutes for soldiers 
that they use when they're jumping out from an airplane at between 2,000 and 5,000 feet. And um, these soldiers, believe it or not, are intensely dedicated to their task. I mean, they are intensely dedicated. In fact, they have a rigorous creed. And, and this rigorous creed says this, and I quote it, I will be sure always. I will be sure always. In other words, I will be certain always. Because they know that the jumpers need the assurance that everything regarding their shoots is perfect. And, and in 20 minutes, it, it takes them in 20 minutes to meticulously pack a military uh, parachute. And that's because it takes 30 folds, 30 folds are required of that chute, perfectly folded, perfectly stacked into that, that uh, parachute. And a jumper has nothing to do with that chute until he puts it on before he jumps out of that aircraft. And so what, what that jumper do, is doing is he's trusting in an error-free performance, an error-free performance. We, they have put their trust in the rigor who has, who has carefully folded that aircraft. And the rigor's creed further states, I will never let the idea that a piece of work is good enough. I will never let the idea that a piece of work is good enough to make me a potential murderer through a careless mistake or oversight, for I know there can be no compromise with perfection. And I was thinking about that, you know, the, the riggers know that their parachute business is, is life or death. Uh, it, it's a life or death enterprise. And, and, and the mistakes, if they make a mistake, it's gonna cost a life. Well, th there's no room for complacency, in other words. And, and I would suggest to you tonight that there is no room for complacency within our, within our relationship with Jesus Christ, within our, our walk, uh, the, the mission that he has given each of us to do. And, and I think that we have um, kingdom responsibilities that we are to take on with equal fervor uh, of a rigor packing that parachute. I will be certain and sure always. One of the things we might remind ourselves when we get up every morning and, and we continue to traverse this life um, that God has laid out for us. You know, Jesus here in his text is teaching true discipleship. Um, and, and he separates the serious from the satisfied. I, I was just talking, no room for complacency. And, and Jesus is talking here about true discipleship in this passage. And, and the passage that, that I'm about to read just prior to this is the highlight, one of the highlights, if not the highlight of Peter. And, and he proclaimed Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answers him when Peter makes a very big mistake. Let's read in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 21. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside. Can you imagine this? Now, Peter takes Jesus aside after what he just said. Peter took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke him. Ooh and he began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you're a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
and forfeits his soul? Or what shall man give in return for his soul? Heavenly Father God, I just want to come before you tonight and <clears throat> take these words, this rebuke that you gave to Peter when Peter had just experienced a mountaintop experience. He acknowledged who Jesus Christ was. And just like that, just like that, he fell. And he committed the biggest mistake of his life. Father God, your son, Jesus Christ, not only forgave him, but he lifted him up and he put him back on that path where he needed to be for Jesus Christ and for the kingdom purposes. So Father, I pray that, Lord, not only open our hearts and our minds, but Lord, uh, let us from time to time be sure that, that we're in your will, be sure that we're on the right path, be sure that complacency as a Christian has no place in our life. And we pray these things in advance, Jesus, for what we ask you to do and believe that you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, um, in, in um, verse 17 here, I didn't read this, but where Peter said in, in, in verse 16, he said, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for a flesh for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so here he is, uh, these two verses earlier, you know, he's on top of the mountain, and, and then he makes, just two verses later, he makes one of the greatest mistakes of his life. He rebukes the Lord. Um, when you stop and think about that, he was rebuking Jesus. Did he really know who Jesus was? I mean, really? Um, you know, even if um, some well-known, respected figure was in, in my presence and, and, and he did something which, um, um, which I just, I, I know it wasn't true or I, I know that he didn't see the whole story. Far be it from me to rebuke him or perhaps anybody else. But Peter does this, and what he's doing is he's placing himself in the way of the Lord, and the Lord is there going to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission on this earth. That's why he came, and Peter's standing in the way of that. Peter didn't know he was doing that when he made that mistake. So Jesus then has to rebuke Peter, and Peter goes from one of the highest pinnacles uh, of, of his life to the lowest position. Well, what happened to Peter is my whole point. What happened to Peter, we can expect the same thing if we're not careful to happen, to take place in our lives as well. And this Christian walk that we have and this desire to satisfy Jesus and, and to grow closer and closer to him. So I want to talk just about three or four things about recovering from mistakes. How do we recover from our mistakes? Well, let's just take this what Jesus said there, beginning in verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone, if any man, your version may say. In other words, if anyone means that there's a candidate out there, and I would submit to you and to me that we are the candidates, we are the candidate that can make a mistake. If any man, and, and, and he's looking straight at Peter, you know, no holds barred here, just as he did when he was on the way to the cross after he had been beaten up and, and, and he looked over there after Peter had denied him three times and he looked at Peter and Peter saw those eyes. He was looking straight at Peter, eyeball to eyeball here in this, in this text here. And he wants Peter to know, you have just committed a terrible sin, Peter. And I don't think that's reading into this passage. In fact, I don't think Jesus' rebuke of Peter, uh, that that really captures the rebuke that he gave him. This means that you and I can be in the same place where Peter was. You may be in a very, a, a very low state. I may be in a very low state of Christian happiness. 
you know, I may have denied Christ as severely as did Peter. Our victory that we had a few weeks ago or a short time ago or the last prayer ago, it dissolves because we did something that was disobedient to the Lord or we, did some, we didn't do something that the Lord wanted us to do or we wanted to try it our way even after the Lord told us how to do this thing or how to proceed in this. And, you know, when, when we deny the Lord, when, when, we, when we commit a mistake, a spiritual mistake, a physical mistake, um, our victory goes out the window. I, I believe it just it goes out the window. We, we don't have that victory anymore that, that we were hoping to have. You know, and, and I don't know if you've noticed this, I, and I'll just make a general statement here, not all Christians, but uh, I often see um, too many Christians, let me put it that way, too many Christians um, who are not in the real place of the victory that Jesus Christ has given them in their walk and in their life. And, and normally too many of them walk around like they're in the spiritual dumps. I mean, they're complaining, uh, uh, God forbid, but the truth is they're gossiping or they're criticizing something or someone or some church or some other believer. And of course we know what James says about this, but Jesus knows, here's a, Jesus knows we all fail. And this is where his great mercy and this is where his amazing grace comes in. He knows that we're human. And I want to show you something in the Old Testament. Keep your finger here in Matthew and turn back to, Matt, uh, to Psalms. Psalm 78. I want you to see something really beautiful here. Because Jesus knows, again, that we are human. We're trying. We make mistakes. Lord, I didn't mean to do that. But we, we missed the ball. Well, listen to Psalm 78, the, the psalmist of, of Psalm 78 here. And listen to what he says in verse 37. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant, talking about the nation of Israel. Yet he, being compassionate, atone for their iniquity, and he did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often, not, not just one time, he restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. Verse 39, he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. That's just a beautiful reminder that, that Jesus knows who we are, that Jesus knows that we are flesh and blood, that he took on flesh and blood so that he knows it up close and personal because he was. You know, I believe that God is, is pleading for any of us today that to understand that, that we are men, that we are women, that we are flesh. And that we can be that any man that, that the scripture is talking about here. We can be that Peter, that any man. And, and I would say that we, if we don't have our armor on, if we aren't seeking to walk in that path with Jesus Christ, uh, we're a real active candidate to be that any man. So you meet and I meet the requirements of any man, just as Paul was, or as Peter was. And that means that any person, any man, any woman, any young person, any boy, any girl, any person as a Christian can be that man, that woman, that teenager, that candidate to making that mistake that causes Jesus to correct us and, and even to a point of rebuking us. So recovering mistakes, first of all, is to realize that you and I, we can be that candidate, if any man. Now look also there in verse 24. Second thing, let me get back here to verse 24. He said, and Jesus told you, if anyone would come after me, let him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
So to recover from mistakes, we have to realize that we can be that any man, we can be that candidate. And then he says that in order to recover from a mistake, we have to have that commitment. We have to have a commitment to God. And that commitment, commitment must be that we surrender our will. We surrender all of our will to Jesus's will. And, and if we don't, because we still are flesh, we're not going to accomplish what it is that God wants us to accomplish. And, and so the flesh, in other words, must be totally surrendered to the will of God, to the will of the Holy Spirit that God has placed inside of each one of the believers so that we would allow the Holy Spirit to work through us to do these things that God wants us to do. But we have to be able and willing to follow him, not just any man. We recognize that as we're a candidate, but then we have to follow him. And, and, and that commitment must be, um, it must consist of, of blind faith. It must consist of a blind faith. And sometimes, most of the time, it's not just a small faith. Most of the time, we can't see what God is doing, what God wants us to do, what God is doing in our life, when maybe he's silent on our prayer, but he's still working behind the scenes. But we have to, our commitment has to be a commitment that consists of blind faith. You know, so many people say, Lord, show yourself to me in this certain way, and I'll commit to you. That's what we're talking about Sunday. We're, we're seeing the invisible with eyes of faith. No, no, no. God doesn't have to show himself. God often will not show himself to us in the midst of a crisis, a storm, or, or whatever it may be. But he's just saying, trust me, follow me. Follow me with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. So there's, there's this, if any man, and then the second way to recover from these mistakes or necessary to recover from a mistake is we have to follow. We have to have this commitment to, to Jesus. And then he says, let him deny himself. If any man will follow me, then let him deny himself. That's the criteria for recovering from a mistake, denying ourselves. You know, we, we may have some who, who can meet or who answer and say, yes, I, I can make those first two points. If any man, I admit, I'm admit that man. And, and I commit to following Jesus. And, and some may be so desirous of living for God that they dedicate themselves as a candidate, even they even make this commitment. But when the criteria, and this is the important here, when the criteria, when Jesus lists the, lists the criteria, many turn back. We learned that in, 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 in uh, several of our, our Bible studies. Um, when that criteria is laid out, then we stop and we pause. And oftentimes we say, well, I really need to pray that self, uh, pray about this. So he says, let him deny himself, denying yourself, denying myself, I would submit is the hardest thing we will ever do in this life. Denying myself for the sake and the commitment and the blind faith to trust Jesus Christ with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. You know, to deny self means we have to put ourselves to death. You know, in other words, our self can no longer live in us. And this is difficult because our self is an enemy to God's mission that he has given to us, to what God has given you to do, to the, the plan that he is to fulfill in your life. And deny yourself doesn't just mean, don't, don't miss this, it doesn't just mean that we have to di discipline ourselves. It means that you and I must make ourselves non-existent, if you will. It, it, it's not thinking less of myself because God doesn't want me to think less of myself. He's blessed me too much to think less of myself. But it, it, it's, and it's not thinking of myself at all. 
Galatians chapter four or, or chapter five, verse 24, Paul talks to the church of Christ, uh, Galatia and he says, I have crucified my flesh and I no longer live, but what? But Christ lives in me. That's the past tense. It's already taken place. And had Peter denied himself right here, he would not have denied Christ later, but he didn't. So the second thing about this criteria that Jesus says you have to deny yourself, the second thing is you have to take up your cross. Take up your cross, his cross, and follow me. Take up his cross. Now, that's not the Lord's cross he's talking about there. It's our individual cross. We all have different crosses sometimes that, that, that God uh, uh, deems that, that we need to carry. But the cross is always a place. The, the cross in Jesus' time, when he went to the cross and died for us, the cross is always a place of execution. The cross always brought death to that person who was on that cross, nailed to that cross. And, and there's no other purpose for the cross, is there? There's no other purpose for the cross than death. And so taking up our cross is exchanging our life for the life and the cause of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Take up our cross in exchange for the life of what Jesus Christ has for us to do. You know, um, the execution of, of giving ourselves up every day, of denying ourselves, it is, it has to be done daily. You know, you may have done, some of you may have prayed this, some of you maybe have committed to the Lord, maybe died today, so to speak, to yourself and, and, and taken on your cross for Jesus Christ. But you'll have to reject yourself or resurrect yourself before sunup, if you get up before the sunrise. Because every day we have to commit. Every day we have to deny ourselves. Every day we have to trust Christ with faith, wherever it is that he leads us. So this execution of ourselves to the cross and the kingdom of Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, takes place every day. And, and let me just say one other thing about the cross. The cross is a place of identification. It's a place when we're executing the cross that, that God brings into our life and that God gives us the catalyst, it's to identify with Christ. And to identify with Christ, we have to have this cross. You know, there's a poem that goes such as this. It said, I counted my worth by things gained in store, but Christ sized me up by the scars that I bore. I coveted honors and sought for degrees. He wept as he counted the hours on my knees. He wept as he counted the hours on my knees. I'm not talking about your physical ability, I'm talking about in spite of your physical ability, how many hours do we spend on our knees before this risen Lord and Savior, this almighty, perfect God? So the, the cross is also a place of victory over sin. Um, without taking our cross, without carrying our cross, we're not going to have that victory that Jesus Christ won on the cross for us. That's why this is, is so serious that we would that when we make a mistake, we recover from mistakes. And then the final thing that Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross. And the last thing he says, and follow me. Jesus is to replace everything in our life. That's what, that's what um, David Platt wrote his book on, on radical. And there were a lot of feelings a lot of feelings about what he was writing, even though he was using Jesus's words, just as I'm using Jesus's words here tonight. Jesus is to replace everything in my life, in your life. Jesus doesn't want any competition. Listen to me. He doesn't want any competition 
with somebody else taking his place or taking even um, some of the time that he's using to develop us and, and to mature us. And, and so if, if we're allowing competition to get in for our sake and our walk and our commitment to Jesus Christ, we're not going to compete. It's as simple as that. We're not going to compete, period. You know, let me just close with this, just, just this thought. If you're a runner, you have to pay a price in order to get faster. You have to pay a price if you're a runner to, for endurance. In other words, to long, uh, to run and endure greater distances. You know, it, it, you have to pay the price to lose weight. I don't know, uh, perhaps all of us have tried to lose weight from time to time. In fact, I, I would submit all of us have, but it's tough, isn't it? We have to pay a price to lose weight. We have to give up some things to lose weight. We have to not eat some things that we just love, but we have to pay that price if we wanna lose weight. When you're in the business world, when I was in the military, we had to pay a price to gain promotions to rise higher and higher in rank, higher in position. We have to pay a price to do that. Listen, you even and I even have to pay a price for, for, for staying just as we are right now. I'm going to say that again. Let me say it another way. If we choose to stay just the way that we are right now, we will pay a price for that. And that price, that spiritual price, and it could even be a physical price or an emotional price. But when we choose not to follow Jesus every day, not to deny ourselves every day, not to take up our cross every day, not to, to seek to, to grow more and more and closer and closer in intimacy with Jesus Christ and in faith with Jesus Christ, and we choose to stay the same, and 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 it hurts me to say this, there are a lot of Christians who have made that choice to stay just as we are. I'm saved, I know where I'm going, I've done my time, now let somebody else do it. I praise God for Pine Drive, that my life sentence here does not apply to the majority of the people in Pine Drive. And in fact, it's, it's the senior citizens that are, that are paying the price to do what God wants you to do in his church called Pine Drive. And so therefore, that's why we have the victory. That's why we see God's hand moving and working. So join me in prayer tonight. And maybe there's a mistake that you need to recover from. Maybe there's some mistakes that you need to recover from. Maybe they have you down, depressed. But Heavenly Father God, we know that um, you're a God of mercy and grace and an amazing grace. And God, we praise you because you don't, you don't give us the justice that our sin, that our disobedience deserves, but you give us grace. Father, we're going to be praying for some of our prayer list tonight, some of them in our hearts. Lord, we know that, that we have perhaps some that, um, that maybe just listen online and, and don't often um, darken the seminary, uh, the sanctuary, Lord. And Father, I'm praying for all of us tonight. To know that we make a mistake, you're there to pick us up. I preached that a few weeks ago, Lord. We all get knocked down. And that's not necessarily a sin, but it's a sin if we stay down. It's a sin if we get up and don't move in your direction. So, Father, we thank you for Peter. We thank you that you looked at Peter as you were going to the cross. 
and he saw love. He saw love. And perhaps it all came back to him in a flash of what you meant when you said you had to die. So Father God, the time is short perhaps short before you return for your church, your people. Time is short for some of us. We never know when, when our particular hour class runs out. So Father, help us in the power of the Holy Spirit that energizes us to cause us to focus totally on you. Nothing in front of you, God. Nothing ahead of you. We say you're our priority. God, I want you to be my priority, my first priority. Every day, every hour, every moment of my life, Lord. And I believe every one of us, Lord, wants to hear those words. Maybe we've been beaten up and bleeding and scarred. But we want to hear those words from you. Well done, good, faithful, committed servant. Come in to your rest. And Father, that's, that's my desire, and, and I, I just believe it's the desire of every person here tonight, Lord. And so we thank you, God, for your word, for your forgiveness, for your ever-present help in time of trouble, for your refreshing waters, for your word, for prayer. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.